Um, string theory and the theory of DNA provide us with an enormous number of possibilities, but they don't tell us what actually populates the world, and they don't tell us how the world became populated. In the case of biology, it's Darwin and all that kind of stuff. So the question is, what's the mechanism by which the universe gets populated with lots and lots and lots of different environments? This mechanism did not come from string theory. This mechanism came from the cosmologist, so the mechanism uh, that we're mostly playing around with now. It's called eternal inflation, and basically I'll tell you what it is in the following simple, uh, simple way. First of all, just as in biology, there's a landscape. A landscape means an energy landscape. It means a, uh, a configuration space of some kind. For a molecule, it's the space of, uh, I don't know, how many uh, atoms in the molecule. And they can rearrange themselves in different ways, and the different ways have different energies. The places where there's a minimum in the energy uh, landscape, those are the stable configurations. They're not necessarily the configurations that things aim towards, but they're the configurations which won't fall apart, let's call it that. In the same way, the configurations of string theory, not the strings themselves, but the way the tiny dimensions, the hidden dimensions are wrapped up, and what's wrapped up on them, they also have a complicated landscape. A landscape which may be as rich as the biological landscape. Many, many different possibilities. That gives you the possibilities. The question is what brought them into reality. The key phrase that cosmologists and physicists like myself are thinking about is called eternal inflation. And it's the idea that the universe in its early, earliest phases was exponentially and rapidly expanding. And it was in one of these basins, in one of these minima, who knows which one. And it started to exponentially expand extremely rapidly. But as it expanded, there was a neighboring uh, configuration, a neighboring um, minimum. And just as you can pop from one minimum to another in biology by the process of mutation, a little bubble formed in the universe, a little bubble of slightly different DNA structure, a slightly different compactification structure. If that structure had a little bit less energy than the other one, it'll start to expand. And then if there's another nearby minimum on the landscape, a bubble may form inside the bubble. Bubbles inside bubbles inside bubbles. There's a mathematics to this. The mathematics has been largely worked out by my colleague Andre Linde and uh, Alan Guth and other famous cosmologists. And what they find is that if you wait long enough, the entire landscape will eventually get popped. The entire landscape means all the possibilities will get populated by this bubbling structure which eventually fills up with essentially every possibility that could be there. If that's the case, the question of why the universe is the way it is settles down to the question of how come we're in the kind of universe that we're in, in if they're all out there. And the answer at minimum must be that we can only live in certain kinds of environments. And not surprisingly, we're in the kind of environment that we can live in. End of story. <laughs> For a lot of physicists, I must say, this, was, this would be an enormous disappointment. An enormous disappointment because most of us at an earlier time had hoped that there would be a small number of principles which would explain everything about the universe. All the parameters of it and everything else and now we're saying, my God, it's no better than biology or zoology. <laughs> and for many, Don't listen to heaven, that. Heaven forbid, <laughs> heaven forbid. For, for some fraction of the community, that's a disappointment. But not for all. Not for all. But not for all. Not in for fact, all. even in the late 80s, I was actually advocating the opposite of the view that both Peter and you were talking about, that somehow our universe, you know, all of us like to think it's all about me. And so physicists were thinking it's all about our universe. But in fact, I had said for a very long time that when I look at the equation of strength theory and actually think about them, it seemed to me that the number of possibilities was far, far larger. In fact, many has given, and his collaborators have given enormous numbers about how many possible universes there are. Would you like to tell, share this with our audience, the numbers that you're talking about? Googleplexes. Googleplexes. Yeah, Google, that, Google that's a technical plexes. term, by the way. <laughs> However, I don't know, I, the number 10 to the 500 is thrown around, but why that number, the, the, it's obviously on the low side. Right. In fact, <laughs> it is. And in fact, and in fact I, I agree with him precisely because I have always wanted that number to be infinite. That's uh, probably, that's probably infinite, infinite, but discreet. But discreet, absolutely. <laughs>